The Charles Stanley Institute for Christian Living presents the C.S. Lewis Lecture Series, Part 4, The Laughter of C.S. Lewis. When C.S. Lewis recorded the creation of Narnia in The Magician's Nephew, a key element is the creation of laughter. Aslan the great lion bestows the gift of speech upon the dumb creatures and ushers in the possibility of the joke. Creatures, I give you yourself, said the strong, happy voice of Aslan. I give you the woods, the fruit, the rivers. I give you the stars, and I give you yourself. The dumb beasts whom I have not chosen are also yours. Treat them gently and cherish them, but do not go back to their ways, lest you become and you cease to become talking beasts. For out of them you were taken, and into them you can return. Do not do so. No, Aslan, we won't, we won't, said everyone. But one perky jackdaw added in a loud voice, No fear! And everyone else had just finished just before it said it, so that his words came out quite clear in a dead silence. And perhaps you have found out how awful that can be, say, at a party. The jackdaw became so embarrassed that it hid its head under its wing as if it were going to sleep. And all the other animals began making various queer noises, which was their way of laughing, and which, of course, no one had ever heard in the world. When the jackdaw asks if he has just made the first joke of Narnia, the lion answers, No, little friend, you have not made the first joke. You have only been the first joke. <laughs> then everyone laughed more till ever, but the jackdaw didn't mind and laughed just as loud till the horse shook his head and the jackdaw lost its balance and fell off. In a letter to his friend Arthur Greaves, Lewis wrote about an old jackdaw that he had called Jack, perhaps revealing his connection to this loud, socially clumsy, and joking creature. The laughter of Lewis was well known in his biographies, particularly with the camaraderie of fellow chaps sitting around in a pub or at the college. Collegial male laughter dominated Lewis's life as a professor, not only with jokes, but with the ripe flowering of good humor that marks British and Irish characters. During World War II, Lewis penned a devilish book that we have talked about that placed him on the front cover of Time magazine. A work entitled The Screwtape Letters, which caused his fame in the English-speaking world to rocket, thrusting him into the limelight. In the 11th epistle, Screwtape writes to his diabolical nephew, Wormwood, and he allow outlines his opinions regarding laughter. There are four causes of laughter, he says. These are the four causes that Lewis develops. You speak of their being great laughers. I trust this does not mean that you are under the impression that laughter as such is always in our favor. The point is worth some attention. I can divide the causes of laughter into four. Joy, fun, the joke proper, and flippancy. You will see the first among friends and lovers reunited on the eve of a holiday. Among some adults, some pretext in the way of jokes is usually provided, but the facility with which the smallest witticisms produce laughter at such a time shows that those jokes are not the real cause of people laughing. What that real cause is, we don't know, said the devil. Something like is expressed in much of that detestable art which the humans call music, and something like it occurs in heaven, a meaningless acceleration in the rhythm of celestial experience, quite opaque to us. Laughter of this kind does us no good and should always be discouraged. Besides, the phenomena is of itself disgusting and a direct insult to the realism, dignity, and austerity of hell. Now, fun is closely related to joy, a sort of emotional froth arising from the play instinct. It is of very little use to us. It can sometimes be used, of course, to divert humans from something else which the enemy would like to have them doing. But in itself, fun has that wholly undesirable tendency. It promotes charity, courage, contentment, and many other e evils. Third, the joke proper, which turns on a sudden perception of incongruity, is a much more promising field. 
I'm not thinking primarily of indecent or body humor, which, though much relied upon by second-rate tempters, is often disappointing in its results. The truth is that humans are pretty clearly divided on this matter in two classes. There are some for whom no passion is as serious as lust, and for whom an indecent story ceases to produce lasciviousness precisely insofar as it becomes funny. There are others in whom laughter and lust are excited at the same moment and by the same things. The first sort joke about sex because it gives rise to many incongruities. The second cultivate incongruities because they afford a pretext for talking about sex. If your man is of the first type, body humor will not help you. I shall never forget the hours which I wasted, hours to me of unbearable tedium, with one of my early patients in bars and smoking rooms before I learned this rule. Find out which group the patient belongs to and see that he does not find out. But flippancy is best of all. In the first place, it is a very economical. Only a clever human can make a real joke about virtue or indeed about anything else. Any of them can be trained to talk as if virtue were funny. Among flippant people, the joke is always assumed to have been made. No one actually makes it, but every serious subject is discussed in a manner which implies that they have already found a ridiculous side to it. If prolonged, the habit of flippancy builds up around a man the finest armor plating against the enemy, God, that I know and is quite free from the dangers inherent in the other sources of laughter. Flippancy is a thousand miles away from joy. It deadens instead of sharpening the intellect, and it excites no affection between those who practice it. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. Lewis saw that many of us are not trained to laugh, or were taught not to. In 1963, he had an interview with Sherwood Wirt of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And Lewis observed that there was too much solemnity in religious groups, a great deal of false reverence and piety, too much speaking in holy tones. <laughs> the Middle Ages would merely combine Christian themes with buffoonery and slapstick and so communicate with the common people. We have been trained not to laugh. The idea of trained incapacity was discovered by Thorsten Veblen at the beginning of the 20th century. And Veblen says, we are trained in such a way that we are incapable of responding to anything else. For example, when I was a student at the University of Southern California, a pigeon flew into the window, and the window was down about three feet. And as it came in, we all were interrupted from the lecture and very glad for the arrival of the pigeon. <laughs> but nevertheless, the pigeon panicked, hearing the professor, and tried to escape. And what does a pigeon do to escape? It flies up. It tries to fly up, and as it did, it hit the ceiling, and we all clapped our hands in glee. No, we, we saw it there. If we could have communicated and said, you're trained to escape the wrong way. If you come down three feet, take a right, you can go out the window and be fine. So we are also trained. Let me give you a little experiment, if I may, and uh, from an orthopedic surgeon when I had both of my hips replaced. Uh, it kind of boggles your minds, but I, I can really change your behavior on this experiment I'm going to run. Without anyone watching you, except for me, sitting there, put out your right foot, lift up your right foot, and make clockwise circles. And I'm going to change that in you. Now, while doing this, draw the number six in the air. All of a sudden, your foot has changed directions. <laughs> you are so incapable, I can manipulate you so easily. And there's nothing you can do about what I have done to you. <laughs> now, we are trained not to laugh, and Lewis saw that. And so what he says, we recognize that, that adults laugh only about 15 times a day, children over 120. We need to realize that there are two ways of looking at life, as if it were a hotel or if it were a reformatory. If we assume, Lewis says, that we are at the Crown Plaza, we will be continually complaining about the service. Not really, that's a bad ad. Let me say that over here. <laughs> if we assume life should be a hotel, we will be continually complaining about the service, the accommodations, the food. But if we see life as a reformatory and our spouses as guards, prison guards, 
we will be full of gratitude for any piece of bread or any breath, breath of fresh air or any friendly face. Our challenge is always to see differently, to see the gladness and the humor of our lives. There are two perspectives that are given by animals, and Lewis loved animals. As you remember, he became a Christian on the way to the Whipsnade Zoo. And so there's the dog diary and the cat diary. The dog, 8 a.m., dog food, my favorite thing, 8.30. A car ride, my favorite thing, 9.40. A walk in the park, my favorite thing, 10.30. Got rubbed and petted on my stomach, oh, my favorite thing, 12. Lunch, my favorite thing, 1 o'clock. Played in the yard, my favorite thing, 5 p.m. Milk bones, my favorite thing. 7 o'clock, got to play ball, my favorite thing. 8 p.m., wow, watch TV with the people, my favorite thing. 11 p.m., sleeping on my bed, my favorite thing. Cat Diary, day 983 of my captivity. <laughs> my captors continue to taunt me with bizarre little dangling objects. <laughs> They dine lavishly on fresh meat while the other inmates and I are fed hash or some kind of dry nugget. <laughs> Although I make my contempt for the rations perfectly clear, I nevertheless must eat something in order to keep up my strength. The only thing that keeps me going is the dream of escape. In an attempt to disgust them, I once again vomit on the carpet. <laughs> Today, I decapitated a mouse and dropped its headless body at their feet. I had hoped this would strike fear into their hearts, since it clearly demonstrates what I am capable of. <laughs> However, they merely made condescending comments about what a good little hunter I am. <laughs> Idiots. <laughs> Today, I was almost successful in an attempt to assassinate one of my tormentors by weaving around her feet as she was walking. I must try this again tomorrow, but at the top of the stairs. <laughs> the dog receives special privileges. He is regularly released and seems to be more than willing to return. He is obviously an idiot. <laughs> As a boy, Tim, Lewis had a dog named Tim. He called the most undisciplined, unaccomplished, and dissipated creature you ever saw on four legs. He never exactly obeyed you. He sometimes agreed with you. Later came the canine Mr. Papworth, limited his owner to their walks. You couldn't go that way with Mr. Papworth because there was a dog that fights. And you can't go that way because there are sheep and you have to keep him on the lead. Allegedly, one of Lewis's cats liked being lifted up by her tail, an operation which he said, I can't imagine I would like if I were a cat. But to Lewis, the practice of taming animals and making them more human-like was an obvious parallel to God's way of making believing Christians more Christ-like. He suggested that domestic animals might somehow achieve immortality in the context of their master's immortality. It is a comforting thought for anyone who has hoped to see their beloved pet in heaven, though not much use to a dog belonging to a non-Christian. <laughs> the kilns where he lived, the brick house, was also a home to cats. One cat, ginger cat named Tom, whom Lewis called a great Don Juan and a mighty hunter before the Lord, but found it quite elitist in its relationships to the point of being snobbish. He would respond to others, but not to Lewis himself. He thinks I'm not quite socially up to his standards, and he makes this very clear. No creature can give such a crushing snub as a cat. For Lewis, both dogs and cats have consciences. But the dog, being an honest and a humble person, always has a bad conscience. Dogs are like publicans and sinners. They know they have sinned, and they repent soulfully, and they rejoice doggily when they are forgiven. Cats are like Pharisees. They always have good conscience and stare down at others. Too good to deign to recognize others, think, thanking God that they are not like these dogs or humans or other cats. As one wag once quipped, cats were once viewed as gods in Egypt, and they haven't forgotten it. <laughs> Getting a perspective on laughter allows us to escape our trained incapacity, to laugh in the presence of God. Two professors, one from the University of Alabama and one from Emory, McMichaels and Emmons, conducted an experiment with three groups of students who were to keep personal journals. The first was simply to record every day's activities. The second was to count, record, and describe hassles. 
The third was merely to count blessings. The significant outcome in the third group included better class attendance, better grades, more satisfaction with life, and better relationships with roommates and family. For Lewis, humans were made to see what God is doing, to see what is good and what is right and what is beautiful. And human beings were also created for laughter. There are several orthodox theological doctrines which may help us understand how Lewis viewed laughter in the Christian life. First is the doctrine of creation. In creation, everything created was good. Good answer. Good. There is, exists no antithesis to goodness. There is no equal good or evil as we've seen in deal, dualism. But good, everything is good. There's no cosmic dualism. Evil must be seen as a falling short of good. Lewis saw that laughter was a created gift, a gift created before the fall. And laughter, like any other gift, can be twisted and bent. But laughter is first and foremost a good, created, natural gift. And within the act of creation, we stumble upon two splendid examples of incongruity, of the sources of laughter. There are two things that are juxtaposed which are so different they will cause laughter. The first incongruity in the story of Eden is our own created nature. We are a mix of dust and divine breath. God breathes into humus, into earth. And presto, we are that amazing oxymoron, a spiritual animal. Spirit and earth make one comic being. On the one side, we're related to the angels, the transcendent, the spiritual, the Amish. And on the other, we're real cousin to jackals and weasels, skunks, and lawyers. The heavens and the earth are married, and the union is a marvel, a mystery, a matter for much mirth. Of all living creatures, wrote Aristotle, only the human is endowed with laughter. Angels, wrote Lewis, do not see anything funny about being purely spiritual. Neither do dogs laugh at being dogs. They don't loiter around the fire hydrant and bark about naughty bits. Woodpeckers don't do knock-knock jokes. <laughs> Monkeys don't human around. No chicken laughs when another asks why the human crossed the road. And other chickens don't crack up when one chicken steps in chicken stuff. <laughs> For Lewis, even coarse jokes which focus on the very natural human acts of reproduction and excretion suggest that humans recognize something dissonant in our nature. Unlike a cow or a horse, we can be embarrassed by the noises and smells which we emit. But we can also find and should find them comic. We should knowing that God has made us both spirit and flesh. What is man, O Lord, that you should crown us with glory and yet bathe us in folly? Now, when we said that God was his own critic and declared everything in creation to be good, we were wrong. There was one condition that God did not pronounce good. There was one joke which was not yet good enough to share. It is not good, he said, that man should be alone. That's only half of a good joke. So the second joke of creation is that God split his image into two, that he made man and woman in his own image. The comic possibilities about and between men and women has yet to be exhausted. Comedy resides in the fact of the creation of genders, of two beings so divinely alike and yet so frustratingly different. What, for example, makes women like my wife laugh at a joke like this? A husband and his wife went to see her doctor. And after the physical, the physician asked to see the wife alone and confided in her. Your husband, in tone solemnly, is in critical condition. But if you are willing to fix him three nutritious meals a day, make passionate love to him every night, and serve his every need, he will live to a healthy old age. When she came out of the office, the husband asked, well, what did the doctor say? He said, you're going to die. <laughs> Or you remember Chuck Swindoll's great story about a couple who went to the counselor, and as the husband sat in a chair, he was kind of bored and resistant, 
and, and he was there and complaining, just folding his arms and looking. And the wife was, was wailing and crying and, and supplicating and trying and saying, see, when we were first married, he was so interested in me. Everything I did was amazing and wonderful, but now he's bored and sits on the sofa and doesn't do anything. And so as she was crying and weeping, the, the uh, psychologist gets up and he walks over and he picks the woman up and he leans her back and he gives her a long, passionate kiss. And he puts her in the chair and she's just gasping. And he looks at the husband and he says, she needs that at least twice a week. And the husband said, how about I bring her in Tuesday and Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> now, of the four kinds, we find that uh, there's also that the kind of true screw tape type story where a man and his wife are sitting in the living room. And he says to her, just so you know, I never want to live in a vegetable state dependent on some machine. If that ever happens, just pull the plug. His wife gets up and unplugs the TV. Okay. <laughs> Now, after creation, the second doctrine is the fall. And Lewis saw the flaw explaining the disease and the dangers of laughter. Laughter like cheese, eggs, oysters, and blind dates can go really bad. <laughs> human laughter can be wicked because the human heart is wicked. The human being is the only animal that blushes, wrote Mark Twain, or needs to. But you have to remember that we were made after a week's work. In the screw tape letters, Lewis explored the relationship between the fallen human condition and humor. Humor, he wrote, involves a sense of proportion, of seeing yourself from the outside. The comic muse teaches us to humbly see ourselves as others see us, and not to worry, but to have a perspective outside our own tragic, myopic view of everything going wrong. H. Allen Smith defined a humorist as a fellow who realizes first that he is no better than anybody else. And second, that nobody else is either, that we are in this together. The reason for the fall is the sin of pride, where everyone takes himself or herself too seriously. Satan, G.K. Chesterton reminded us, fell through the force of gravity. He took himself too seriously. Thus we picture hell as a state where everyone is perpetually concerned about his or her own dignity, an advancement where everyone has a grievance and where everyone lives the deadly serious passions of envy, self-importance, and resentment. In short, a church deacon meeting. <laughs> As Garrison Keillor said, some people think it's difficult for a Christian to be a Christian and to laugh, but I think it's the other way around. God writes a lot of comedy. It's just that he has so many bad actors. For the Christian, the doctrine of the fall is a fact. Personal experience confirms theological doctrine. We cannot escape the preponderance of hard evidence that convicts our soul that we do not live as we ought to live. We fall short every moment of God's righteous standards and our own meager expectations of ourselves we fail continually. And one of those kinds of laughter that we fall on is flippancy. As we mentioned, it jokes about virtue, about goodness, about justice. It is cruelty disguised as joking. Our throats are like open sepulchers, graves where dead laughter exists. It is the weed of flippancy grows in the soil of superiority, and it is the laughter of our culture. We have so many flippant communicators on television, and the commentators there use this kind of flippancy to divorce us from what is good and what is right. The grubby root of this kind of humor flippancy is meanness. Over a cup of coffee and a winking sneer and a rolling of the eyes, we mock others. We laugh, but we know we should be repenting. Now, beginning in middle school and high school, derision becomes a primary mode of self-defense. Humor becomes a weapon among young girls in particular as a means to be terminably cool. Smart Alex and mean girls who have all the answers. And there was uh, recently a report, a news report, about a certain private school in Washington that was faced with a very unique problem. A number of 12-year-old girls were beginning to use lipstick and they would put it on in the girls' restroom. That was fine. But after they put their lipstick on, they would press their lips to the mirror, leaving dozens of little lip prints. Every night, the maintenance man would remove them, and the next day, the girls would put them back. Finally, the principal decided that something had to be done, so she called all the girls to the bathroom and met them there with the maintenance man. 
She explained that all these lip prints were causing a major problem for the custodian, who had to clean the mirrors every night. To demonstrate how difficult it had been to clean the mirrors, she asked the maintenance man to show the girls how much effort was required. So he took out his long-handled squeegee, dipped it in the toilet, and cleaned the mirror with it. Since then, there have been no lip prints on the mirror. There are teachers, and then there are educators. So flippancy can be cleaned. The next cause of laughter Lewis identified is the joke proper. And as I mentioned, I believe there's a divine incongruity in our nature as spiritual animals. For Lewis, the oldest joke there is, is the fact that we have bodies. It makes us into buffoons. It humbles us when we try to be too dignified, too pretty, or too spiritual. And for Lewis, whatever claims reverence risks ridicule. Try and lift up some person or yourself onto a pedestal, and you'll find that God mocks you. He laughs from the heavens at our silly pride. Now, grace arrives for the Christian in the incarnation, and it arrives with a body. The incarnation strikes a staggering blow at the Pharisees, the Gnostics, and anyone who would deny the physical world, or those who try to be more spiritual than God. It is significant that for Augustine, the devil and the bad angels do not have bodies. The medieval carnival exploded out of the incarnation of becoming flesh. Even the early Corinthians, you remember when they celebrated the Eucharist, they were celebrating the body and blood of Christ, they tended towards excess. There are and there should be checks upon our laughter and our joy. But the body itself was created good and redeemed in joy. Like Bruegel's painting, if you remember, the saint teeters in a battle between carnival and Lent. We are torn between promiscuity and prudery. Most of us fall both ways and slip into both worlds. Yet for the Hebrew and the Christian, the comic spirit is one of new life, of feasting, of banqueting, of eating, of drinking, and playing. The paradise is regained when heaven is described like a wedding feast in Cana, or a sumptuous banquet. St. Francis called his body Brother S. Exquisitely right, observed Lewis, because no one in his right senses can either revere or hate a donkey. It is a useful, sturdy, obstinate, patient, lovable, and infuriating beast, this body of ours. Deserves now a stick and now a carrot. There, one of its functions in our lives is to play the part of the buffoon. Now contemplate your own body. You cannot reflect too long without becoming self-conscious, filled with despair, wonder, and hopefully hilarity. There's a wonderful apocryphal story about G.K. Chesterton, who was the man who created the sanity in Lewis's reading. And Chesterton, as you may know, was over 300 pounds, about 350 pounds. It was a journalist. It was just one of the wittiest people in the 20th century, I believe. And what Chesterton would do is he would go on stage, the British stage, with the life force advocate George Bernard Shaw. And Shaw and Chesterton would debate their own philosophies. Chesterton, a strong, devout Roman Catholic full of orthodoxy, and Shaw, the life force, the spiritual life. Now, allegedly, during one of these debates, Chesterton was beating Shaw so much. And so Shaw came over and tapped Chesterton on his belly and said, Gilbert, when it's born, what are you going to call it? Huh? How do you slap? And Chesterton said, Well, George, if it is a boy, I shall call him John. If it is a girl, I shall call her Mary. But if this is gas, I shall call it George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> There's also that kind of wonderful apocryphal story that, that uh, we deal with from 1969 in July, just, uh, what, about 40 years ago, when Neil Armstrong first walked on the moon from his Apollo spacecraft, and every, the world heard his famous words, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Yet the apocryphal story goes that he also made another, more enigmatic remark. Good luck, Mr. Gorski. He never explained the significance of that wish, that, that statement, until July 5, 1995, in a Tampa Bay newspaper interview. He responded that Mr. Gorski had finally died, and he felt free to share the background story of good luck, Mr. Gorski. So when I was a kid playing baseball, someone hit a foul ball, and it went over to the Gorski's house. 
And so I had to go and retrieve it, and it was under the bedroom window. And I heard Mrs. Gorski say, sex? You want sex? You'll get sex when the kid next door walks on the moon. Good luck, Mr. Gorski. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or there's that 80-year-old woman who was arrested for shoplifting. When she went before the judge, the judge says, well, what did you steal? She said, well, I, I stole a can of peaches. He says, well, I'm going to give you six hours in jail, one for each of the peaches. And her husband said, well, may I say something? He said, yes. She also stole a can of peas. <laughs> there is a generational difference between women and men. And, and, and that's where the humor comes from. Um, even, uh, even as a baby boomer, I made traditional vows in my wedding for better, for worse, for sickness and in health. My wife had her more kind of more recent vow. She said, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be held against you. It was there. Now, beyond the joke, there is fun and play. This is the third category that Lewis defines, the laughter of the earth, the laughter of just enjoying our physical nature. It is the laughter of play in the best sense. The Westminster Catechism, as you may remember, says that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Enjoy. What a delightful command that is set before us. Like Eric Liddell in Chariots of Fire expressed it, I feel God's pleasure when I run. When you feel God's pleasure, what are you doing? When do you have the pleasure of God and enjoying Him? Part of that pleasure is to surrender to God's natural gifts, to the things He brings to us. Rain, Chesterton said, should be viewed as buckets of water God has mischievously poured upon us and is just cackling above to watch us get drenched. Also, waiting for your wife to get ready, and you're so impatient. Chesterton says, think of yourself as waiting for a fish to bite. You can spend a long time for that fish to come. And when your wife finally comes and you've caught the flounder, you're very happy. <laughs> we need to observe what we enjoy as children and not lose that delight. In fact, Chesterton points to an experience of children, uh, the habit of wanting things over and over again. When you read a book to a child, what does the child say? Read it again. When you take a child and you throw the child up in the air and you catch the child, what does the child say? Do it again. When you take a child and you throw the child all the way around and you sit him down and you're dizzy and your back is hurting, what does the child say? Do it again. So, Cheshire says, God is like that. Every morning the sun comes up and God claps his hands in glory and says, do it again. Do it again. And Chess says, we have become so old so fast of not enjoying these kind of simple things that are there. Lewis echoed this thought. He said, it is if a man once said he had taken a walk once or once taken a bath or once slept or once kissed his wife. If something is worth doing, no matter how simple a pleasure it is, it is worth doing again and again. Now, the laughter of fun has its roots in two words, humus and humere in the earth and the moisture of our lives, where humor dwells with the lowly, the common, the vulgar, and with all the animals in the manger. Humor, humor humanity, humility, all find similar roots. The fact that man was made from the dust of the earth seems to imply to me that our humor is therefore going to be very earthy at times. The fact that women were created from a rib above the waist and near the brain seems to suggest a higher kind of laughter among women. <laughs> now, joy, the final kind of laughter. It is the laughter of heaven, the secret of the Christian life. But it comes out of sorrow and woe, from the crucible of suffering, absence, and separation. You must have these negative experiences often before you experience the laughter of joy. But this deep, abiding laughter of joy comes without tears, promising health, wholeness, and reunion. The desire of joy, as we mentioned, haunted Lewis until he found its source in God. Now, Lewis also confessed that he didn't go to the Christian faith to be made happy. For a brief time, he says, happiness can be found in worshiping yourself or in a good bottle of port wine, but only for a brief season. God does not provide any settled happiness or security in this life. He provides inns along the journey, but he wants us to know that we are pilgrims. We are strangers in a strange land. This is not our home. 
but God still whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but He shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to wake us up. He allows our suffering as a means for perfecting us. He does not house train the earwig or give baths to centipedes. He washes and cleanses us in preparation for the great banquet and wedding feast. But in our pleasures, God whispers, and if we can listen carefully, we can hear him laugh. Laughter for Lewis, like music, percolates as thanksgiving and praise. Our enjoyment of something bubbles up and should overflow with gratitude. Our rejoicing should be robust and virile and spontaneous. In fact, our praise for one another and to God is verbal laughter. Whenever a husband praises his wife or a wife praises her husband, a reader praises a book, the praise completes and consummates the joy. Praise is the finished, it's the last punctuation on our pleasure. We've had a good meal, a good talk, a good evening. Praise is a blessed reminder of the laughter and love. Now the ultimate laughter of joy is the reunion. In Narnia, whenever the children return, there are hugs and kisses and laughter all around. Everyone comes back together again. Think what happens every time you unexpectedly see someone in an airport. Think of how you look at them and laugh for no particular reason other than seeing the other being reunited. So our great reunion with God himself in heaven conjures up images of a fun and festive wedding feast, a giant banquet. Heaven is not an interminable church service or an academic lecture even on laughter. Out of death comes life. Now when a minister asked three of his parishioners what they might want him to say at their funeral, the first said, say that I was a good and faithful Christian man, that I loved God. The second suggested that the minister said, he served God, he loved his wife, he was good in all that he did. And he looked at the third man, the man said, well, I'd like you to look at, this, at the funeral, look down and look at my body and say, oh God, he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> May God give us the laughter that moves us, that even resurrects us into new life. Now what we find is that there is a connection between our bodies and our attitudes. Dr. Hagerstuff saw that not only was the body funny, but there is a strong correlation between your facial expression and your emotional state. Paul Ekman's research on nonverbal communication demonstrates that emotions are connected to bodily behaviors. By putting on a certain kind of face, whether of fear, anger, or amusement, a genuine emotional reaction is triggered in your body. You become what you put on your face or what you do with your body. For example, let me first tell you, sit up straight. Everyone, take some time and sit up straight. Now suddenly you feel brighter. Everything is making sense. Your posture is there. And I'm going to take you through a series of muscular exercises that will help you expand your laughing potential. If there is this correlation between our emotional state, our spiritual state, and what we do with our bodies, we will see. The first thing, the first muscle, is called the zygomaticus major. The zygoma is the cheekbone. And the zygomaticus major is the muscle that connects the cheekbone to the corner of the mouth. It is the polite smile. Okay? It is an artificial smile. Now, there are about 17 different varieties of this kind of zygomatic smile. And if you look at it, the smile of relief, the fake cocktail party smile, and the after church nice sermon smile, Pastor. <laughs> it is a voluntary muscle used by people to put on a phony expression of humor. They smile only with their cheeks and not with their eyes. So this is what it looks like. Okay, everybody straight face, zygomatic. The second group of muscles, a fine sheath of muscles around the eyes, is called the obicularis oculus. And it's used on the beach on sunny days or early in the morning when the alarm clock is starting to go off. This muscle does not obey the will, but it adds a squint which gives us crow's feet. It bestows sincerity to our smiles and also splashes the eyes with a twinkle. We also discover pupillary dilation. 
In nonverbal studies, your pupils get large when you see something interesting. We are attracted almost unconsciously to dilated pupils. If you see someone and their pupils are dilated, you find that they are interested in you and then your pupils get larger. This can also happen, though, in dark restaurants where your pupils are dilated and everyone thinks you're interested in them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Straight face, zygomatic, orbicularis. The obicularis is one of the most underdeveloped muscles uh, that we have, so we need to keep practice squinting. You hold it, okay? You will be tired in about half a minute. In fact, as you remember, um, your face gets tired at weddings. When you're at wedding lines and people are coming through and you're always smiling, you, your muscles have not been used and, and they become weary right away. So fear, physical weariness comes upon you when you laugh so hard. Now, the next set of muscles are the platysma and the frontal. The frontal opens the laugh up, for some people all the way to the back of their head, okay? The other, the platysma opens the face down. The lower lip and the neck muscles pull down to show the teeth, okay? So here, straight face, zygomatic, orbicularis, frontal, platysma. <laughs> Come on. Uh, if you don't want anyone to bother you in church, sit like this. <laughs> Now, when all of these steps have been completed, we find that the body can produce a complex set of muscular contractions. A coordinated contraction of the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles, all preceded in microseconds by a slight tightening of the anal sphincter. For obvious reasons. You never knew that God built that in, but he had to. If he hadn't, you'd be laughing out of both ends. <laughs> The next step is abominable, abom, abom, ad, abdominal and vocal and communal. Now you place your hands on your belly and you expel air, okay, your own stomach. Okay? Now, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, beware the man whose belly does not move when he laughs. What you want to do is give yourself over to laughter like you give yourself over to love. Not be afraid to laugh that is there. However, also, you begin to lose control of your body at this time. When you reach this kind of stage of laughter, convulsions and exhaustions there, uh, between 1962 and 1964 in Uganda, there was an epidemic of laughter and then also in the Toronto Blessing uh, that, that just really took over people and it became pandemic. Now, and if there's a quantity of liquid matter in you, it will escape indecorously. For internal agitation and jouncing may be so strong that the sphincters are unable to resist. What happens if you laugh while you're drinking milk? It comes out your nose. Back in 1972 in Denver, Colorado, I was on a blind date at a spaghetti dinner. I was funny, I was witty, I started laughing, a noodle came out my nose, okay? One of the grossest things, I didn't get a second date. But it is there, the body has no control when you turn it over to laughing. So let's try one more time. Straight face, zygomatic, orbicularis, Frontal, platysma, and communal. Touch each other and roll around. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> God has designed a close relationship between our bodies and our moods. Thus, there exists a therapeutic benefit to rejoicing when Paul says rejoice, and again I say rejoice. We rehearse our laughter and we find that it heals us. As Proverbs 15, 13 says, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face. And we know now that a cheerful face towards one another will make a joyful heart. One may surmise that the ideas that men and women live by will lead to health or sickness. For Lewis and for me, there has been a great deal of false reverence about spiritual matters. We have been flooded with too much solemnity and speaking in holy tones. But to those who seek God, he will yet fill your mouths with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. All who hear of this, as Sarah said, will laugh with us. It is the best defense of laughter we can offer. One thing, G.K. Chesterton said, that God hid from us when he walked upon the earth. He did not hide his tears when he looked down upon Jerusalem and wept. He did not hide his anger 
with the money changers and the Pharisees. The one thing that he hid from us when he was on this earth, the one thing that was too great for any of us to bear was his mirth. Now it has been good to be in a fellowship of humorists. We are all apprentices, fools for the kingdom of God. This does not mean, however, as one kind of caveat, that we must choose between being serious and comic. The opposite of serious is not comic. It is trivial. The opposite of comic is tragic. So one can be serious and comic simultaneously. There is one parable, old story, that I'm going to close with that, that gets to what Lewis has been talking about here in Laughter. And it's seen how God is involved in it. And it's a story about a billionaire down in Florida who invited just a whole group of friends down and he was showing them how wealthy he was, his Monet paintings, his antique automobiles, his precious gems. He says, but the one thing that I really value is out here in my backyard. And he took them to the back and there was an Olympic sized swimming pool filled with alligators. And he says, I value courage. And if any single one of you well, jump in that pool and swim across. I'll give you whatever you want. People were backing away, but there was a splash. And suddenly there was a young man in the pool and his arms were moving so fast, thrashing through the water, alligator jaws coming after him and getting him. He just moved and got through the pool. The other side, he jumped out. He was drenched and just, just shivering. And the billionaire came out and said, that was incredible. That was amazing. He says, what do you want? He says, I want to know who pushed me in. <laughs> We look at this valley of tears and we wonder who pushed us in. We look at the pool of alligators that we work with and we wonder who pushed us in. And Lewis says we must move out of this trained incapacity. We must look and see that God has interrupted our lives, not only with love, but with laughter. For Alice in Wonderland, the Cheshire Cat leaves in a most appropriate way. It sat and it chatted then it vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end of the tale and then ending with the grin, which remained some time after the rest of it had gone. I hope that as you slowly vanish into the day, that the zygomatic grin will linger and be the last thing to go. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for part four, The Laughter of C.S. Lewis, brought to you by the Charles Stanley Institute for Christian Living.